What a glorious thing. I'm so glad to be back with you folks. And, <clears throat> you know, it's Christmas and I thought, you know, I've, I've had this, this interesting relationship with Jesus, uh, sometimes known as Yeshua. And apparently his parents called him Jeshua, Jeshua ben Joseph. So I'd like, you know, I like to think of him as a human being named Jeshua. Um, and I started studying A Course in Miracles, which apparently came from him when I was 18 years old. And I had a, a, a training from parents and culture um, that really caused me to believe that I was an atheist. So here I am, an atheist, studying A Course in Miracles, reading words like atonement and salvation and the Holy Spirit. Part of me was gagging. How could I be reading this? But another part of me was going, there's something here for me. And so I had this very split love, hate relationship with what I was reading and studying. And I went straight to the workbook lessons and one lesson at a time, the structure of it, the discipline of it, it kept me off the streets. It, it, it kept me occupied at a time where um, substance abuse and all kinds of acting out was going on with my teenage self. But this one thing was sort of like a light in the darkness moving me forward. Um, and I never did get over the Christian terminology. But in 1993, number of years later, I had this experience where I started hearing a voice inside my head that identified himself as Jesus. And it was a very gentle, loving, very wise voice. And immediately I thought, I'm making this up. I must be hallucinating this. This is crazy. And the voice said, yeah, you are making this up. We're all making this up. But ask yourself, Scott, does this voice represent unconditional love? Does it make your nervous system relax? Do you deeply, on, a, on some level, trust that it's going to lead you home? So whether you call me Jesus, Jeshua, or your higher self, or whatever you call me, let's just start chatting. And I was um, very excited, uh, but very doubtful. I actually went to a psychic um, at the time, and I said, what do you see around me? What's going on? And he said, you're having a Christ experience. And that validated for me and it helped me trust to just go with that. And so I started asking questions of, of Jeshua. And one of the things he told me, which shocked me, was let go of studying A Course in Miracles. It's holding you back. And this has been, you know, a 10 year commitment on my part. Um, so it was very scary for me to just let it go. But when I did, uh, I started to hear his voice ever more clearly. And it was like trading in an ancient modem for high-speed internet. And I recognized that, that The Course in Miracles was structure from the 1970s, from two people, Helen and Bill, who needed a certain way of, of connecting with, with his teaching. But that I didn't need that anymore. I, I, I could hear him in my head. He had a sense of humor. He was lighthearted. He spoke to me in rhyme, in poetry. Um, he was speaking to me in a language that I could best understand, that went right into my heart. All of the ideology and philosophy of A Course in Miracles, it just went out the window. And all there was was this heart connection with my elder brother. And at the time, it was like my, my, my intellect 
was was surrendering and dissolving into my heart. And there was a song written by a friend of mine named Linda Worster um, that had verses from the Bible. And, and I, you know, I had been like freaked, screw the Bible, man. And, and um, somehow this song, even though it had the, uh, the dogma of the Bible, it, it actually started to, to, um, to help me just cry uncontrollably uh, without any understanding of why I was crying. But I did feel my heart open up every time I heard the song. And I want to share it with you. <clears throat> because as far as I know, songs are sometimes coded. Um, they're coded to, to help us awaken whether we understand the why or the not. Um, I don't know if I'll remember the whole song, but, but I'll remember the first verse and the second verse, and that's enough. Years ago when I was young When grown-up pride had not begun Before I learned to be so strong My mom and I would sing this song Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me his presence tells me so I changed the words from the Bible to his presence and let's go straight to the last verse I have grown I have changed but the child in me remains it's the little one that knows the truth that lets the spirit flow on through so i sing this little song for the child within us all don't reject him for he knows about the way that brings us home jesus loves this I know, for his guidance tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong, yes Jesus loves me, oh yes Jesus loves me. loves me his presence tells me so and can you imagine me hearing that song singing that song over and over again tears running down my face and somehow everything that I learned about about protecting myself from dogma and religion and beliefs you know it all just melted and that song just went straight into my heart what a glorious meltdown that was for me and and jesus or my favorite name for him yeshua began co-creating with me he said you know we're going to bring a course in miracles into 
the 21st century. We're, we're going to like, like make it more accessible, make it more playful, make it less dogmatic, make it more feminine because it was a very strong masculine voice of authority that, that was in the course at the time. And he said, Scott, you're going to be my scribe and we're going to do it in a language that you're going to have the most fun with, Dr. Seuss. So it started when I was reading Dr. Seuss to my daughter. She was two years old and I put the book down and I started to hear more rhymes, more Seussian rhymes, except they were, they were wise. They were, they were spiritual. And I went to my computer and I started to, to write and, and two months of, of scribing and I had my first piece, which became a YouTube sensation called If Dr. Seuss Studied A Course in Miracles. I think that was the first title. And then every year a new poem came through me. Um, now they're all written in, in one book uh, called, Oh, the Places Your Ego Will Go. But I always thought that, that it's, um, it's more of an energy transmission for me to, to share the poems with you rather than have you read them in a book. So I'm going to share one of the poems with you. It's about fear and it's about the end of fear. So I like to think of these poems as a kind of an ayahuasca shamanic journey with words without the, the drugs. So uh, are you ready? You ready to go on a journey? I think she's ready. I see a lot of thumbs up going on. Gather my friends, cause the end times are here. Not the end of the world, but the end of your fear. So turn down the lights, make it dark now, I dare ya. Stick around for a while and I'm gonna unscare ya. Now, when you were young and most things were quite swell, fear knocked on your door with a product to sell. And like most good salesmen, he cast quite a spell while selling insurance called All Is Not Well. Now, all is not well came in its own case, the case that there's danger all over the place. And after you bought it, your all is not well, you felt it your duty to share and to tell. And so mouth to mouth was how fear procreated with no YouTube or Facebook to disseminate it. Fear soon went viral all over the globe using old time religion to dispense and promote. Cause fear knew the way to get globally big was to drive a false wedge between God and her kids. And that's how he came to be so domineering by replacing God loving with, you must be God fearing. Then fear and religion began co-creating and cooked up a symbol of fear they called Satan, as if infinite love had a worthy opponent with pitchfork in hand who could pounce any moment. The concept was great for maintaining control, making people behave as if they're on parole. Cause when God-fearing people are scared for their souls, they put much more silver and gold in the bowl. So business was booming and fear kept on spreading and fear loved the credit the devil was getting. Cause fear itself likes to stay hidden from view and play hide and seek in its host, which is you. I'm not afraid, I'm just angry at shouts. I've been mistreated and need to speak out. I'm not afraid, I'm upset and I'm caring. There's so many disguises that fear and joy is wearing. He's proud of his wardrobe because he designed it. Though he wouldn't admit it, fear is quite clothes minded. So he doesn't realize he's often looked funny 
wearing layers of stress, wearing layers of worry like some stress bunny. And when you're not looking, he dresses you too in stress bunny outfits that don't become you. Because when you wear worry, it wears tight and stiff. From statically clinging to imagined what ifs. Worst case scenarios fill your projector. Then fear says, don't worry, I'll be your protector. He shows you his life insurance policy and says, here's what you get when you sign up with me. You get top-notch around-the-clock security, an armored alarm system on your body. And if you're harassed, I'm your personal bouncer. And for making decisions, I'll be your guidance counselor. No more will I let you take risks that could hurt you. Just stick with me, kid. I will never desert you. Now, all of your loved ones have already signed. Don't be a black sheep. Join the flock. You'll be fine. So you signed up and breathed a sigh of relief because you thought you'd feel safer with fear as your chief. <sighs> but you didn't read the fine print. Actually, I may need to take a little reminder here. Um, yeah, but the, but the contract had fine print, too fine to be seen, and you didn't read the clause that denied you your dream. From then on, heart's desires that came to be birthed were blocked by your fears before they could reach earth. It seemed your new policy's whole life protection was more birth controlling than all contraception. How could you give birth to a life more abundant with fear in your ear like a cable news pundit who's yelling, oh, I'm telling the truth fair and balanced, while drowning out most of your love, gifts, and talents. <sighs> now, fear says, get real! That's his bottom line thing. And fear learned what's real from his friend Stephen King, whose collection of books make outstanding addictions, as long as you realize you are reading fiction which is what you can do with your mind's fear collection. Just transfer them all to your, to your fears fiction section. Because no matter how gripping a tale fear could tell, its original premise that all is not well is a bit topsy-turvy in this universe and deserves to be laughed off the face of the earth. Oh, and while you are laughing, you let in the light, which makes fear pack his bags and get on the next flight. Because he needs to feel needed. And when you choose joy, fear has no chance but to be unemployed. He used to feel needed when lions were chasing you, gathering speed with intentions of tasting you. But nowadays, most of the lions we find are fictional cats roaming round in our minds. And when you stop feeding the cats in your head, they just go away because they're not getting fed. And with a clear head, you are free now to choose a channel that's broadcasting much better news. So you get off your couch and turn off the TV and tune into W-L-O-V-E. It's got no commercials and nothing to sell. Just a steady reminder that all is quite well. And all is quite well is insurance enough. You're already covered by a plan you can trust. You've got Universal, the original plan. There's never a moment you're not in good hands. You're no longer buying fears insurance scam because you know every moment you're in good hands. 
You know every moment. You're in good hands. Nice breath. Just take a breath. Breathe that in. The deep knowing. All is well. All of the time, you're always in safe, steady hands. <sighs> 